January the 3rd, the date in which um, the incident is alleged to have occurred, the date in which the constructive possession is alleged to have occurred, he is not in the casino. He is not in the Ocean Resort. The address for Ocean Resort is 500 Boardwalk, um, and that address does not appear anywhere for the entire day of January 30th. And it starts very early in the morning um, at, it goes into January 2nd at, at 22.05, which is 10.05. And then the next um, entry is January 3rd um, at 10.52. And he's not there. Um, and I think that's significant uh, because it's not just Rank's speculation that maybe she misidentified and he had the bag. Allegedly, that was supposedly uh, similar to the one which the heroine is in. This is definitive evidence that on the day in question in which the complaint is charged, that being January 3rd, 2020, he's not charged on January 1st, he's not charged on January 2nd, the complaint in question alleges on January the 3rd, 2020, he was in fact in constructive possession of this heroin. And this is absolute proof, positive evidence that he was not. Um, and and I, I, the state suggested that it's unreliable. I mean, I, we subpoenaed it by way of a, an enforceable subpoena. It was given to us by Nicholas Solomon. Um, let me see. His title is Pretrial Services Manager. He gave us the information um, on February the 28th. I'm reading an email where he emailed it to us. So I think that I've met my burden um, with respect to uh, the motion to reopen. And, and, you know, I'm looking at the law right now, Judge. And as I started my argument, um, my position essentially is that we really shouldn't be, uh, we, we shouldn't be reading this with, with such a strict construction, um, especially when we're talking about leaving a gentleman in jail, which we all have reason to believe I suggest that the case against him is is clearly not strong um, and putting him at risk with the COVID-19 situation that's going on, um, I think is, is a risk that is undue and, uh, and unjust. And it says the hearing may be reopened before or after a determination by the court at any time before trial if the court finds that information exists that was not known to the prosecutor or the eligible defendant at the time of the hearing. Um, it, it, they did not have the GPS documents. They just didn't. Um, that information was, was not known. And I don't know how Judge Walden would have ruled if, in fact, those documents showed um, uh, ap with absolute certainty he was not the individual who came back to retrieve the items on January the 3rd or not. The, 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 the bottom line is those documents were not in existence. They were not in existence until February the 28th when I received them via email as a result of my subpoena. Um, and I think we have a situation here where clearly... Uh, there is significant reason to doubt that my client is, in fact, guilty of, these, uh, of the charge. And I think that as a result, I would respectfully ask that Your Honor allow me to re-argue the motion for detention um, and that we've met our burden as far as the statute is concerned. Alternatively, um, as Your Honor is also aware, there is a, there's a statute, um, 2A16221, and that is allowing the temporary release of an eligible defendant. Um, and at the end of it, it says for another or, or for any other compelling reason. And I started my argument um, this afternoon with the fact that there's been significant changes in the court system, in the country, in the world, as far as this um, COVID-19 pandemic is concerned. And that on March the 9th, Governor Murphy declared a state of emergency um, in response to this novel uh, virus outbreak. And on March the 11th, the World Health Organization classified it as a pandemic. And as of March 19th, there was 742 positive cases in New Jersey and nine deaths. And by March 27th, only eight days later, um, the cases increased to 8,825, almost a 1,200% increase and 108 resulting in death. That's just by way of the medical background. And then on March the 21st, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 107, closing all non-essential businesses across the state and mandating that New Jersey residents remain in their homes unless essential and or emergency purposes, unless for essential and or emergency purposes. In addition, if they left their home, they had to maintain a distance of at least six feet from others. Presently, as of March 30th, um, just two days ago, uh, the number of COVID-19 in New Jersey is inclined to 16,636 with 198 deaths. Um, it, it's well known that incarcerated defendants um, typically have poorer health situations than those in the general population. Even in the best of times, the medical care and the detention facilities are limited. Um, 
And uh, it's only a matter of time before the virus enters the, the, the prison population with the same degree that it's entering um, the rest of the country. The, the, the present situation, the present medical situation, the pandemic, um, is that the, the, the country, the, the county jails are essentially a breeding ground for, the, for this infectious outbreak. And these incarcerated defendants, Your Honor, they live in close proximity to one another and they have little access to hand sanitizers, which in the jail they have to be non-alcohol based or the ability to engage frequently in hand washing or other safety measures that's been recommended by the CDC, including um, the direction of the governor, such as to say, staying six feet away from each other. I mean, that's just not, that's impossible to happen in, in the county jails. Um, they're not closed environments. They can cause COVID-19 to spread like wildfire. Introducing just one carrier of the virus um, can impact the entire facility. Uh, it puts people at danger not only in the facility as well as when either a staff or an inmate returns to the general public and interact with others. I mean, it's, it's a horrific situation that this country and the world has, has just just have not experienced. Um, he is presumed innocent. Brandon Harper is presumed innocent. Um, he has not been found guilty of any crimes which he's charged. And in light of the current situation, I think that it would be significantly undue and unjust to continue to detain him on, on a case that has such little weight of guilt in his uh, uh, against him. Uh, it's just, it's... I would not want to be in a situation, Your Honor, that he's in. Um, also, in light of the governor's current quarantine orders, um, it's not like he would be roaming the streets. He would be essentially confined to home release. And as a result, I would ask that Your Honor either take that fact into consideration on the motion to reopen or, or, or on, in the alternative under the statute for temporary release until we have somehow um, put this pandemic uh, under control whenever that occurs. Let me hear the state, Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Judge. Judge, um, uh, like uh, Ms. Lord said, she was not the defense attorney who uh, was there at the detention hearing. But the same arguments she's making now is the same arguments that Mr. Roselle made at the detention hearing. It was that it's not, it was not uh, Ms. Harper's drugs. It could have been someone else's. Um, but uh, Judge Waldman uh, still felt that the state had uh, proved that um, that uh, Mr. Harper should remain detained. Um, and two points for that, Judge. Uh, it's on or about January 3rd that Mr. Harper uh, possessed these drugs. And that, and ultimately, the drugs were found in his room. The room was registered to him, Mr. Harper. And that being said, Judge, um, he was on level three monitoring plus. He was on GPS monitoring, as Mr. Lord said. He was on probation for um, a, a prior drugs charges. So for all those reasons, Judge, the state is asking that this defendant remain detained. Ms. Lord, back to you. Thank you, Judge. I think one significant omission, as I indicated previously, is that Judge Walden was not made known of the date in which he, Mr. Harper um, allegedly registered the hotel, which was two full days before the incident. Thank you. All right, again, I've reviewed the notice of motion and accompanying certification, the attachment, which are the um, electronic monitoring records of, of Mr. Harper. I've reviewed the state submission. I also reviewed the uh, proceeding in, in front of uh, uh, Judge Waldman. And, uh, Judge Waldman considered the argument that Mr. Harper uh, was not at the hotel on the 3rd of January, however, pointed to evidence that the room was registered in Mr. Harper's name and that Mr. Harper had been seen at the hotel, if not on the, 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 the second, then, then uh, the first. And in, in my view, um, Waldman considered all of, uh, of this. And insofar as the argument is that given the change in, in global circumstances, that the, the matter should be uh, uh, reconsidered, 
um, that does not, in my view, undermine the, the Waldman uh, decision that, number one, there was probable cause, and that's notwithstanding the submission of those um, electronic monitoring records. And we also found, and found very specifically, that Mr. Harper uh, was a, a danger uh, uh, to the community, that he had been on release at that particular point, then on release for a very serious charge. And uh, in light of the fact that Mr. Parker had picked up the new charge under circumstances where uh, there was proof that it was Mr. Harper's hotel room, that Mr. Harper had been in the hotel room, if not 24, then 48 hours before the CDS was was discovered, that Mr. Harper should be detained, and that hasn't changed. So I'm denying the application. We can go off the record, Luke. I'll take the next matter. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir.